Well, let's look to the Lord in prayer, and we will dig into our study, and then we'll uh, conclude our time with uh, some prayer. Father, thank you for your great grace for sinners such as us, making a way through your own Son to reconcile sinful man with a holy God. And you have entrusted to us the gospel of your grace. We pray that you would help us to be faithful, to know the message forwards and backwards, to look for opportunities that you'd give us boldness, to speak forth the excellencies of Jesus, uh, use our small fellowship of believers here to affect the Rogue Valley and uh, wherever else around the globe that you would uh, send the ministry to this church. Use us to advance your fame, we pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Come on in, guys. And there's more handouts up front if you if you want them. I apologize. There's no PowerPoint tonight because I forgot to put it on a memory stick to put on the computer here, and I don't even know how to use the computer here yet. So, uh, Lord willing, maybe uh, next week I will have my act together. But there's no promises there. <laughs> so, well, we want to start our evangelism training, gospel readiness. Thinking about evangelism, that's foundational. When I mention the word evangelism, are there feelings of anxiety or embarrassment? Does the thought of confronting someone cause fear? Are you shy or timid like I am? Or unsure what to say or how to get started? Maybe you regret past opportunities like I do that uh, would have been very easy to fulfill and discharge our duty in evangelism. Whatever the case you find yourself in, this should be an exciting and encouraging study for us as we examine scripture to define biblical evangelism. Because what we want to do is we want to emphasize faithfulness over fruitfulness. One is our responsibility and the other is God's. Uh, we want to uh, look at the kind of faithfulness that God's called us to uh, rather than visible fruit, which often has been the emphasis when it comes to the gospel. So in my non-PowerPoint presentation before me, uh, <coughs> behind me, the, uh, the first slide would be the danger of saying too little. And um, for those of you joining us on, on Zoom, I apologize that I don't have a handout for you guys, but I will make sure to get it on my website real soon, okay? So we got thumbs up, everyone's happy. So to the contrary, many evangelistic methods and programs try to minimize the amount of gospel truth hoping to accomplish more and more by doing less and less. But can I kindly and in a gentle way tell you that that is not biblical evangelism. Many modern techniques caution us not to say too much. And certain issues are labeled as taboo. Issues like mentioning God's law. Christ's absolute lordship over life, the imperative of turning from our sin, or surrender, obedience, judgment, or even if we should actually men mention that H-E uh, double hockey sticks, that there is a real hell that is going to be inhabited for eternity future. And so the, I, want us, I want to underscore this in our thinking of the danger of saying too little. When we are reducing the message, it robs it of its power, populating the church with counterfeit faith, whose hope hangs on a bogus promise that some sinner's prayer or a religious or emotional experience saved them. I had a lot of emotional experiences every night when I went there. You know, I, I grew up in the wacky prophecy conferences of the 70s when, uh, you know, we saw people dying in the guillotine and the tribulation. And uh, uh, I was going to bed every night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And, you know, it, 
there was never any message about turning from sin and embracing Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so there's the danger of reducing the message. We rob it of its power. You notice in your handout, the second bullet point, offering lip service but scorning him with their hearts. Now, a passage that's coming up real quick in our Mark series is that reference there, Mark 7, 6. In Mark 7, 6, Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So it does not matter what we profess with our lips if our lives are missing. Offering lip service but scorning him with our hearts. How about casually affirming Jesus with our mouths but denying with our deeds? Titus 1.16 talks about those who profess to know God but by their deeds they <clears throat> deny him. Or superficially addressing as Lord, Lord, they stubbornly decline to do his will, Luke 6, 46. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? So our speaking must match our living. And notice that final bullet point there. They fit the tragic description of the many who are told by Jesus I never knew you. Depart, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 23. I don't remember who I was interacting with last week over that passage, but as far as I'm concerned, Matthew 7 has got to be one of the scariest passages in all of the New Testament. It's one thing to, be, to hear the message that you're separated from God and going to hell, but you can do something about that. You can repent and believe. But when you think you're on your way to heaven and are deluded, and at the end of the age, when it's too late to do anything otherwise, Jesus says, I never knew you. Well, I thought I knew you. Well, Christ commissioned believers to teach all that he commanded. That's the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 20. And by definition, the gospel is the entire good news that he came to proclaim. So no man-made gimmicks is the, uh, or manipulative approaches will move people to repent. Our responsibility before God is to glorify him by proclaiming Christ and him crucified and leave the results to God. <clears throat> you know, we're not to uh, put another notch in our belt. Well, look at this person that I led to, to Jesus. How do we know if the transaction actually happened in the heart of the person that we just shared the gospel with? Uh, there's more, there'll be more on that later. But in our gospel readiness study, it'll help move you towards fluency with the saving message of Christ while equipping you to proclaim a clear and understandable gospel message if you're faithful to you know, come out on Wednesday nights or Zoom. Uh, <laughs> Those of you that are joining us by Zoom, work hard. Your ability to articulate the gospel message will increase significantly, not to mention the impact that the gospel has. The more we meditate on the message that saved our own sin-sick souls and we rehearse its glorious truths together, we, we grow in wonder, love, and praise of our Lord. On the... Uh, the next slide, the biblical foundation is where we want to go. The biblical foundation. Our biblical foundation for evangelism will answer what makes biblical evangelism distinct from all other approaches. We start by examining three aspects of evangelism. Number one is the motivation, which is what will concern ourselves with a few remaining moments tonight. And when we pick up next week, we'll look at the message and the method. So tonight we'll look at the motivation and then the message and then the method. Motive, message, and method. What motivates believers to evangelize? It's not, you know, it's not like we have to manipulate believers and strong arm them and make them, you know, browbeat them, make them feel bad. <clears throat> what motivates believers to evangelism? 
Second of all, what characterizes a biblical gospel presentation? Because we are, we're actually audacious enough to say that there's a proper message versus an improper message. And then what are the guiding principles behind the message? So as you look at point number one, the motivation, notice what it is. Believers are motivated by understanding Christ's command. Believers are motivated by understanding Christ's command. Letter A, if we love God, we will obey him. It flip sides to the same coin. For instance, you'll notice the reference, Matthew 22, verses 37 to 39, if you wanted to, return, uh, to turn there with me. Matthew 22, picking up in verse number 37. Now, the context of this is the previous verse, verse 35, when the lawyer asked Jesus a question, testing him. Testing speaks to his motive. It's not like he really wanted the answer. Uh, and when he says, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And so Jesus answered him. He said to him, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. True believers are characterized by sacrificial love, are they not? For instance, if you wanted to cross-reference in your mind uh, 1 John 3.16... First John 3.16, where he says, We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Or if you wanted to jot down 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 18, that's the uh, personality and the actions of love in the love chapter. If this type of love will selflessly and compassionately proclaim the good news that Christ laid down his life on behalf of sinners. For if we're loving God, we'll love our neighbor as ourselves. Yep. Uh, number one under letter A. So if we, we said if we love God, we'll obey him. Number one is love for God always expresses itself in a lifestyle of obedience. And notice that's underlined, a lifestyle of obedience. There are a few. Do you have a handout? Yes, they're right uh, in the front row. Thank you. Oops. Yeah, there you go. Sorry about that, Jerry. So you've got a few references down at the bottom of that slide on the biblical foundation. First John, since uh, I'm in First John now, First John five, verse number three. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Notice how in New Testament theology, we've got a merging of love with obedience. Jesus said, uh, why do you say you love me and do not do what I commanded you to do? True biblical love for God will evidence itself in patterns of obedience to Christ's commands. Now, notice what I said. Patterns, not perfection. You know, as, as you've got it underlined in your slide, a lifestyle of obedience. This is not the perfect practice of our lives as believers, is it? <clears throat> but it is the practice. And it, you know, so there's been a change of direction. It's not a perfect direction. We, I think it's D.A. Carson who, who has said that we slump towards holiness. You know, we, we fail miserably, but we, our direction has changed. And yet churches are filled with people who call themselves Christians, yet they're indifferent to his commands. Christ could not be more clear that the evidence of salvation is an obedient life. 
back in John's Gospel, John chapter 14, verse number 26. He said, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That's a good verse, but not where I was going. I think I jotted down the wrong uh, reference. 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. There we go. Mm -hmm. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. What a precious picture of intimate fellowship there. You remember what James 2 is all about? James 2 is about the practice of obedience, true religion, undefiled. Being doers of the word, not hearers only. We won't bother to go there this evening. But how about the Great Commission given to the church at the end of Matthew's Gospel? Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Verse 19, he says, Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So his command to evangelize couldn't be any clearer in Scripture. There's no exemption for timid personalities or spiritual immaturity. When I uh, was a young man going off to Word of Life Bible Institute, everyone had to sign up for a Christian ministry. And I didn't know what the acronym OAC stood for, stood for so I signed up for it. It stood for Open Air Campaigners, where we went to Boston and New York City and with our chalk drawings uh, preached on the streets. And I was scared spitless. I am your classic introvert. Uh, you can't get somebody more introverted than me. And uh, um, so I put some of these things in my spiel here just to remind myself too. You know, as we launched into our series tonight thinking through when you mention the word evangelism does your heart skip a beat do you have butterflies in your stomach because every command in scripture is god's enablement for his children is it not and so when he commands us to do something he gives us the ability there's no way out for timidity or spiritual immaturity 2 Timothy 4, 5 says, do the work of an evangelist. Now that's more than inviting people to meetings, though I think it's automatically assumed we ought to be inviting people to Grace Bible Church, should we not? Um, we also need to be uh, speaking up. It applies to normal Christians. It's hard to avoid it without avoiding the Bible. We got verse after verse talking about how we need to Show our love for God and our obedience to him. John Stott commented of this challenge and opportunity. And he said this, quote, The invisibility of God is a great problem. It was already a problem to God's people in Old Testament days. Their pagan neighbors would taunt them, saying, Where is now your God? Their gods were visible and tangible, but Israel's God was neither. Today, our scientific culture, young people are taught not to believe in anything which is not open to empirical investigation. How then has God solved the problem of his own invisibility? Good question, Dr. Scott, Dr. Stott. The first answer is, of course, in Christ. Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the only Son, has made him known. You see how wonderful that is? 2,000 years ago, people say, well, there's no way by which the invisible God makes himself visible today. Well, you return to 1 John 4, 12. No one has seen God. It's precisely the same introductory statement, but instead of continuing with reference to the Son of God, it continues that if we love one another, God dwells in us. In other words, 
The invisible God who once made himself visible in Christ now makes himself visible in Christians if we love one another. It's a breath they can claim, says Dr. Stott. The local church cannot evangelize proclaiming the gospel of love if it is not itself a community of love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is how the invisible God is made manifest through his church. Early disciples did this constantly. According to the Bible, all Christians have received this commission that Jesus gave his church. You know, this seeking and saving of the lost. In uh, Luke 15, we've got these parables of lostness, right? Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Um, so how do we, how can we say that we follow him without inviting people to come to Christ? If we're his disciples, but we're not seeking the lost coin, the lost sheep, or the lost son. We say, yeah, we're followers of Jesus. We're just not doing what Jesus did. That's a, that's a disconnect. You know, there's, there's no retirement age. Just a clear command requiring believers to put the name of Christ on display. 1 Peter 2.9, I think I included this verse in our opening prayer. It is our job to tell forth, to show forth his excellencies. So we need to be faithful to proclaim the gospel and, the first, un and, and, and first understand evangelism as obedience. Connect that in our brains. Okay? We want to... Now, I read you a quote from Dr. Stott, um, but it was a different one for later on in the lesson because I got all beside myself trying to get the techno stuff set up for everyone. This is what I, where I really wanted to, to quote on this point. In uh, Personal Evangelism, John Stott says this, this commission, speaking of Matthew 28, is binding upon every member of the whole church. Every Christian is called to be a witness to Christ in the particular environment in which God has placed him. Further, although the public ministry of the word is a high office, private witness or personal evangelism has a value which in some respects surpasses even that of preaching since the message can then be adapted more personally. So when Paul says to his protege, Timothy, to do the work of an evangelist, we think, well, that's the preacher's job, right? Because Paul's telling Timothy that. Well, it's equally so for everyone that's in the body of Christ. So now that I butchered my quotes by uh, putting them in the wrong order here, we're talking about the motivation that if we love God, we will obey him. And number one, love for God always expresses itself in a lifestyle of obedience. Number two, on the next slide, love from God expresses itself in love towards others. Love from God expresses itself in love towards others. Every believer knows the love of God and must show that love towards others. You know, this is We find this in uh, Galatians 5. This is a fruit of the Spirit. It's the fruit of a redeemed life. And we cannot say that we love God if we don't love others. How can we say we love God and don't love his people that he died for? That's a total disconnect. One of your references there is Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts. And that's where the other stock quote uh, that I already read, you know, when, when we are loving our neighbor as ourself, we're loving others in the fellowship, we are putting God on display, making the gospel believable and obeying the Lord. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts. The life of the local congregation makes the audible gospel visible. Just think, 
As you serve the saints, you're turning everybody's eyeballs into ears so they can hear God's truth of the good news. They understand your message. Martin Lloyd-Jones taught evangelism is preeminently dependent upon the quality of the Christian life, which is known and enjoyed in the church, unquote. A striking example of this truth is found in John Bunyan's experience. He recounted it himself in his autobiography entitled Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, by which title he meant himself. Bunyan tells this story. Bunyan says, One day the good providence of God did cast me to Bedford to work on my own calling. And in one of the streets of that town, I came where there were three or four poor women sitting at a door in the sun and talking about the things of God. And being now willing to hear them discourse, I drew near to hear what they said, for I was now a brisk talker also myself in the matters of religion. But now I may say I heard, but I understood not. For they were far above, out of my reach, for their talk was about a new birth, the work of God on their hearts. Also, how they were convinced of their miserable state by nature. They talked how God had visited their souls with his love in the Lord Jesus, and with what words and promises they'd been refreshed, comforted, and supported against the temptations of the devil. Moreover, they reasoned of the suggestions and temptations of Satan in particular, and told to each other by which they had been afflicted, and how they were borne up under his assaults. They also discoursed of their own wretchedness of heart, of their unbelief, and did contemn, slight, and abhor their own righteousness as filthy and insufficient to do them any good. And methought they spake as if joy did make them speak. They spake with such pleasantness of scripture language and with such appearance of grace in all they said that they were to me as if they had found a new world, as if they were people that dwelt alone and were not to be reckoned among their neighbors. At this, I felt my own heart began to shake as mistrusting my condition to be not. For I saw that in all my thoughts about religion and salvation, the new birth did never enter into my mind. Neither did I know the comfort of the word and promise, nor the deceitfulness and treachery of my own wicked heart. As for secret thoughts, I took no notice of them, neither did I understand what Satan's temptations were, nor how they were to be withstood and resisted, etc. Thus, therefore, when I had heard and considered what they said, I left them, and I went about my employment again, but their talk and discourse, it went with me. Also, my heart would tarry with them, for I was greatly a affected with their words, both because by them I was convinced that I wanted the true tokens of a true godly man, and also because by them I was convinced of the happy and blessed condition of him that was such a one. You know, think about Bunyan as he interacted with true believers who made the message so real in his own life. Every interaction with unbelievers needs to be characterized in our lives by gentleness, kind and compassionate, meek love that is further defined in 1 Corinthians 13. This love for God not only motivates us to evangelize, but it characterizes our interaction with unbelievers. I don't care if they're unbelievers working on shutting down our Christian liberties. They are not the enemy. They're the mission field. They're the gospel opportunity. Amen? You know, this, this genuine love is exemplified by the Lord Jesus in Mark 2 with the paralytic, in John 4 with the woman at the well, and in John 9, the man born blind. The Apostle Paul refers to confronting sinners with gentleness and meekness. Paul says, I urge you by meekness and the gentleness of Christ. In another epistle, in Colossians, he says, put on a heart of compassion Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy, with gentleness, correcting those in opposition, if God may grant them repentance. Romans 2, 4, 
states that it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. That's why I, I pray that God would express kindness in granting faith and repentance as a benevolent gift from his hands, you know, as I pray for the salvation of kids, other family members, that God would be so gracious to grant them faith and repentance. Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 13, the opening verses to the love chapter, that even if you came with the most eloquent speech, the most articulate message, but don't have love, what's he compare you to? An annoying, abrasive gong, a clanging cymbal. So this second point, love from God, expresses itself in love towards others. As the life of the local congregation makes the audible gospel visible. Letter B, your next slide in my non-PowerPoint presentation behind me. <laughs> we said in letter A that if we love God, we'll obey him. Letter B, if we obey him, we will glorify him. Those who are truly redeemed will glorify God with their lives. I take you back to a sermon that uh, you might have heard from this pulpit two weeks ago on glorifying God rather than man. The glory of God is, the most, is most clearly demonstrated when we put the person and work of Christ on display by living in obedience to his commands. 1 Corinthians 10.31. Anybody memorize it? Pop quiz. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. In Matthew 5, 16, the, long, you know, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached, the longest sermon ever recorded in Scripture, he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's why we're saying if we obey him, we'll glorify him. God is glorified as we obediently proclaim the gospel of Christ. And we understand only God can bring a sinner to repentance. We're responsible to make the message clear and understandable. So if we love God, and uh, seek to glorify him, MacArthur wrote in his book, The Ultimate Priority, quote, We worship God by proclaiming his word with clarity. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it did with you. 2 Thessalonians 3.1 When his word is given exposure, when people hear it and are saved, God is glorified. It's not rocket science. It's not hard to understand. What brings glory to God? Obedience. Do what he's commanded us to do. We give the message concerning Christ, otherwise they can't get saved. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing. Hearing, hearing. hearing. right? Hearing. Yeah. hearing by the word concerning Christ. If they don't get the message concerning Christ, how are they going to believe? And how is God going to be glorified? Again, we're emphasizing the point. That uh, we're looking at evangelism as an obedience issue. If we love God, or if if love, if we love God and desire to obey Christ, and that doesn't motivate you, let's think through what possible reasons could be. If love for God and desire to obey Christ don't motivate you, maybe number one, we have a greater fear of man than a fear of God. Perhaps you're more afraid of being rejected by man than faith and confidence in God's ability to humble a sinner's heart while trusting in his strength and wisdom. Remember the verse that I think we wove into the sermon last Sunday? We're not to uh, fear them who can only kill the body. We're to fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Again, Jesus says, fear him. 
So maybe our, we're lacking in our evangelistic escapades because we're fearing man more than God. Or number two, maybe we've got a pattern of not applying God's word. Because you read but don't apply, your heart is becoming indifferent to his need to obey Christ's command. Now you choose to neglect those commands that are inconvenient to make you feel uncomfortable. What, is there a third option? Sure there is. Some people don't share the gospel because they need to examine their own salvation. Are you in the faith? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Has our birth certificate been authenticated that we're the real deal? Maybe obedience is impossible because you aren't saved and still in the cords and bondage of sin. You really don't believe the gospel and don't know Christ as Lord and Savior. So if motivation is glorify God through obeying his command to evangelize, it follows that we must proclaim a God-centered message. And that, that's what we'll pick up when we start looking at the gospel message. God is the first word of the gospel. So we want to glorify God. J.I. Packer wrote in his uh, book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, we glorify God by evangelism, not only because evangelizing is an act of obedience, but also because in evangelism, we tell the world what great things God has done for the salvation of sinners. God is glorified when his mighty works of grace are made known. We're just talking about Jesus and how he saved our sin-wrecked souls. And we do so out of obedience and love for him. Now, it's bewildering that after all these years, there's still an urgent, obvious need in the professing church to clarify the gospel message. You would think, dear friends, that with more than 2,000 years of history behind it, with all the faithful Bible teachers and reformers through the centuries, you'd find some level of clarity on what it means to be a Christian. I've been in the ministry for 25 years now, plus. And I'm amazed at how many churches I have been to and pastored. And the, where I get started with people in my relationships is the gospel. I want to know if I'm dealing with a brother or sister in Christ. I want to have some confidence. And so I ask the evangelism explosion question. Sir, ma'am, if you were to die today and stand before God and you were to say, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? And so often the answer is, well... That's a good question. I want to say, well, then answer it. <laughs> or they'll say, well, I don't know. Well, let, let me hope you know. You've got to have a no-so faith that you know what you would say to him. But with every new generation, every few years, regularly in the church, we need to explain the gospel to the church. We're not trying to provoke controversy for its own sake or being overly critical, but the gospel, the only saving message of Jesus, is under continuous, relentless, satanic attack. The enemies of the gospel and their errors are widespread, insidious, and deadly, and they permeate the church. What's especially troubling is that the most harmful attacks on the gospel are not coming from outside the church. They're coming from the church itself. The typical modern evangelical church has abandoned scripture as its pillar and foundation, leaving it vulnerable to all sorts of doctrinal errors and aberrations. Instead of defending and proclaiming the true demands of the gospel, the church has absorbed and adopted the very worst traits of the ungodly culture around us. You know, I think of a friend of mine. You know, one of the thumbprints of, in ministry has been beloved friend and mentor John MacArthur. You look at the, the scores of books that he has written. Uh, here's what he said. He said, clarifying the gospel has been the center of my pulpit ministry since my first Sunday at Grace Community Church more than 50 years ago. As a result, virtually every book, because many times your writing ministry comes out of your preaching ministry. You want to write yourself clear. You want to preach clear messages. So anyways, 
He said, as a result, virtually every book I've written has addressed the message of the gospel, dealt with a harmful theological trend that was damaging the evangelical church, and changed and, and, and challenged readers to think deeply about salvation in Christ. Think of some of the works. Ashamed of the Gospel, Hard to Believe, which is down there in the recommended reading pile, Truth War, Tale of Two Sons, The Jesus You Can't Ignore, Strange Fire. Perhaps the oldest and best known of the books that took evangelicalism by, with a, in a storm was the Gospel According to Jesus. That's why we're spending a little time for these next few weeks together, making sure we can speak the gospel blindfolded, backwards and forwards. We want to have our PhD degree in the good news. We cannot meditate on it too much. We cannot think through a clear presentation of the message too much. And so in our gospel readiness, we started with the danger of saying too little and the need for a biblical foundation. We dealt with the motivation tonight. Next week when we gather together, we'll look at the message and the method. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news. And what amazes us almost equally as much as, the, as you setting your love upon us is that you would limit the extension of your kingdom to the faithfulness of your people. What an amazing and astounding privilege. Help us, God, to be faithful, to look at preaching the good news, sharing gospel tracts, inviting people to church where they can hear more on the matter. All of this is an inestimable privilege that you've afforded us. Help us to just discharge our duty in faithfulness. We know that many times tracts are gonna be thrown away Many times people will hear us and not respond. Lord, I thank you for times that I've heard in my life, 20 years later, of a way you used me. And maybe you didn't let me know at the moment that you were converting a soul because I would have gotten a watermelon head through it. Keep us small in our own eyes and constantly usable, being ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that lies within. Thank you for the privilege. In the name of our Savior, who set us free from our sins. Amen. Amen. I'll be back, Zoomers, after I shut this off.